Hi, it's Mrs. Lomando back to read you Clean Getaway. We are at Route 14, so far from home, and we're heading down to the Pelican State, which is Louisiana. They ride in silence for a short time, no music even, but when g -Ma spots the exit sign for Edwards, Mississippi, she gasps. They don't take the exit, thank goodness, but as soon as they pass beneath the bridge, g -Ma bites her lip. Apologies, William, I have to pull over. Scoop doesn't move a muscle as they glide to a bumpy stop on the shoulder of the highway, or so Dad calls it. He truly wishes Dad were here now. This whole day has been a lot, and even Dad's signature scowl makes Scoop feel more stable. I know I said we're going to keep it moving, but that exit we just passed, that city was our stopping point last time. It's where we turned around. Scoop's not sure what he expected her to tell him, but it wasn't that. And I know he's finally going to get an answer to one of his questions. Why did you turn around, Jima? Your father. My father? Yep. But I thought you took the trip before he was bo- Oh, I see. I wasn't paying attention to the date when we had to stop in Meridian, but after that encounter with the officers in Jackson, sickness crashed over me like a runaway freight train. As we pulled off here in Edward so I could get some air, your G-Pop mentioned the date aloud because it was his late father's birthday. That's when I realized I was pregnant. Wow, Scoob is rooted now. So what happened? Well, we were nervous about having a baby, certainly hadn't planned one, but it was also exciting. Problem was, we didn't know if we'd be able to find a doctor who would treat a white woman carrying a black man's child where we were headed. So we turned our RV around. Dang. Were there really doctors who would turn away a woman with a baby in her stomach? That's deep, Juma. It was a hard decision, kiddo. We knew returning to Atlanta might be trouble for a number of reasons. Some of your G-pop you wasn't even aware of. But we also knew we'd have a doctor. Jimmy said he'd never forgive himself if something happened to the baby. So that was that. Trip over, Scoob says, finally feeling it. Indeed. The sound of the other vehicles whizzing by fills the cab and Jima peers at Scoob, which makes him wonder if she's about to call him the wrong name or crumple again. But then she smiles. This is the farthest I've ever gotten, Scoobadoo. Congrats, Jima. She blushes and spins her chair around. I'm going to take a quick potty break and freshen up. If you don't mind, then we'll be on our way. Cool. When she disappears into the bathroom, Scoob tries to sift through some of the new stuff he's learned. Yeah, Jima's happy, which makes Scoob happy, but the word contraband still hasn't left his mind from when they were in front of the Evers house. And now there's more mentions of trouble and reasons for not returning to Atlanta, which reminds him of pickpocketing, petty theft, poor decisions. There's stuff G-Pop wasn't even aware of. In strange sleep talk about fixing it, Shifting license plates, suspicious diamond earrings. By the time she slips into the driver's seat, grinning at him like it's going out of style, all Scoob's questions have condensed into one. Who is my g -ma? To Scoob's surprise, g -ma decides to pass to Vicksburg. Nothing here but a Civil War memorial. And I think you and I have had enough P.U.S. history for one day. She holds her nose while she says this. But the suns begin to sink. By that time, they cross the state line and stop for tacos in Monroe, Louisiana. So he's not surprised at all when she says she needs a nap. And they head to an RV park right after. Who knew there were so many? As soon as she vanishes behind her bed curtain, leaving Scoob at the table drawing in the margins of his map, he's made a decision. He's calling Dad. He waits until he can hear the faint snores before creeping into the cab of the RV and easing into the driver's seat. He slowly reaches into the door, but the phone isn't there. He looks all around, checks every possible spot, cup holder, center console, glove box, nothing. Did she hide it? Yeah, she was being weird about him making a call earlier. Okay, fine. Has been weird about the phone in general, especially when it comes to dad. But would she really put it somewhere he couldn't find it? What if there was an emergency and he needed to call 911? Surely she considered that, didn't she? Bewildered, Scoop returns to the live-in part and quietly, carefully checks every place of concealment he can see. Cabinets, drawers, anything that opens. There's no phone. But Scoob does make an unexpected discovery in the hidden space behind the kitchen TV. Rubber banded piles, four of them, of crudely stacked green paper rectangles. Money. He pulls his hand back like something's bitten him and shoves the TV back into place. Then he plops down in the dining room. Gma groans, but barely even registers. In a way, Scoob guesses it makes sense for her to have a lot of cash. He did just sell her house, and that's all he's ever seen her use to pay for the stuff. But then the word pops into his head again. Contraband. This definitely feels contraband-y. Or is he overthinking? 
he does know it suddenly makes sense why parents don't want their kids watching R-rated movies. His imagination's running wild, which is not helpful in this moment. What if she like robbed a bank before she came and got him? He's gotta do something. Heading to a neighboring, neighboring camper or to the campground offices to ask for a phone seems a little extreme. This isn't life or death, at least he doesn't think it is. Besides, after flipping through Green Book, which is safely back beneath his pillow, and hearing Jima snores about stories about the olden days, Scoob's not sure he wants to walk around this campground alone. Yes, there were five whole safe places listed in Monroe, Louisiana, but still, everyone who's seen this campground so far has looked like Jima, and there's no forgetting the way these people were glaring at him in Alabama just a few days ago. He sighs and lets his head drop back, which is when his eyes fall on Jima's treasure chest beside the kitchen sink. Normally, he wouldn't snoop around her stuff, but maybe she slipped the phone in there when he wasn't looking. He takes a super deep breath, glances at the bed space curtain one more time, and rises to grab the box. Decides to take it up into his bunk and scope it out because at least then he's got his own curtain to hide behind and will have time to stash it if she happens to get up while he's committing what feels like breaking and entering. Once he's sequestered away, he closes his eyes and sends a silent apology in Jima's direction. Then holds his breath and lifts the lid slowly, carefully, quietly. Scoob removes Jima's most treasured relics piece by piece and lays them out. Things he didn't notice before, a weirdly large silver coin, half dollar, it says, what the heck was that? A piece of heavy paper the size of, and shape of a credit card. Upon reading, Scoob discovers his Jima's old driver's license. A stack of business cards rubber banded together, all of which appear to be from jewelry stores. And then there's a thin gold necklace he saw her lay on the table earlier. The charm looks like a miniature skeleton key, like the one Shanice has for the trunk that belonged to her great-grandfather, who was apparently some big deal baseball player. Then he's looking down into the maroon velvet. The pink diamond earrings aren't there, which is comforting, but terrifying. What if his mind is playing tricks on him? Also the opposite of comforting, there's no phone. A burst of fury shoots from Scoob's belly like a geyser to the brain. He hates everything and wants his dumb trip to be over. After shoving all Jima's drunk toward junk toward the bunk's back wall, there's no way he's putting any of it back now. And lying on his back, Scoob shuts his eyes. One thing's for sure, William Scoob Lamar's never felt so far from home. Route 15, back to sleep. Speaking of home, the next time Scoob opens his eyes, he seems to be back there. When he arrived, he's not sure. Can't say he remembers the return journey, but there are familiar things. Impeccably neat entryway, empty peach bowl on the table. Dad? Scoob smiles. Dad's reclined in his lazy boy with his hands tucked behind his head and his eyes closed, listening to his favorite Smokey Robinson and Miracles album. This is real music, son. What do you know about that? In front of a crackling fire, humming along like he doesn't have a care in the world, much less a son he hasn't spoken to in days. Nervous, Scoob creeps down the low-lit hallway. Despite Dad's clearly chill demeanor in this moment, Scoob's even seen the Scoob's seen the switch flip before. Cool, calm, collected to furious in a matter of moments. Dad's never laid a hand on Scoob before. Doesn't believe in corporal punishment, as he calls it. I taught him that, Gma once told Scoob. But the ice that rolls off Dad when he's angry, well, Scoob hates how small it makes him feel. He stands right in front of the chair. Hey, Dad. No response. Dad doesn't flinch. Scoob raises his voice. Dad, I'm back. Nothing. Maybe he's asleep. Scoob steps right up to the chair, his heartbeat thundering in his ears like an angry storm. Hey, Dad! Dad hums for a few seconds, moving his head in time to the music, and when he stops, he smiles. Scoob takes a deep breath, then gulps, reaches his hand out to touch Dad's shoulder, except his hand never connects with anything solid. Holding it up to his face, Scoob realizes with a start he can see right through it. Scoob looks down at his arms and torso and legs and feet, then it's see-through. He's all see-through. Rushing into the hall bathroom, Scoob flips the light on, looks in the mirror. He doesn't have a reflection, like a ghost. Out the door and around the corner into his room, which doesn't look like his room at all. He has a reddish brown desk, same mahogany as Juma's treasure box, where his bed should be. Book shelves, book filled shelves line the walls where he'd normally see his superhero posters. Instead of his personal treasure chest, which is full of action figures, Lego sets, and a collection of obsolete computer parts Dad has given him, there's a fancy looking high back chair and ottoman. Scoob rushes to the kitchen to check his personal pantry shelf. Some of the cereals and fruit snacks and s'mores Pop-Tarts Dad wishes Scoob wouldn't eat, but buys anyway. There's nothing but a box of grape nuts, a container of dry quinoa, and a gallon Ziploc bag of... Bleh, who knows? Even the board where Dad scribbles Scoob's daily instructions has gone. Every trace of Scoob seems to have been erased. It's like he never lived there. Dad, he shouts. Dad, please hear me. 
I'm so sorry, Jimmy, Dad says. His body isn't moving, but his mouth is. But it's not his voice. It's Gima's. What? Dad, it's me, Scoop. It's William, Dad. Your son. I did the wrong thing, but I'm going to make it up to you, Jimmy. Dad says in Gima's voice again. Looking at Scoop this time. Well, through him, apparently. Scoop stumbles back. Dad's eyes are pure white. No irises, no pupils, nothing. We're already past where you and I got before William and me, Dad continues. You would just love William to pieces, Jimmy. He's the best grandson there is. Reminds me of the best parts of you. Dad rises from the chair with a pillow in hand and walks towards Scoop. Dad, what are you doing? Scoop stumbles backward and falls as Dad advances on a pillow at the edges. Held at the edges with both hands, he leans over and lowers it towards his son's face. Scoop squeezes his eyes shut. I just hope you'll forgive me one day, Jimmy, Dad is saying. I'll never forgive myself, but I hope you'll forgive me. I'm going to make it this time. I'm going to do what we planned. You'll forgive me. Dad! The sound is muffled. Scoop can't breathe. He twists and kicks and flails. And when he finally manages to inhale, his eyelids snap open and there are tears running down into his ears. He bolts upright, desperately thirsty and wanting to go to Dad, but smacks his head on the low ceiling of the bunk. Ow! He shouts. Jimmy! Comes Jima's voice from the other end of the RV. Jimmy, are you all right? Jimmy! The sound trails off and soon Scoob is hearing her soft snores again. He breathes in deep and tries to get his heart to slow down. Holds his hands up to his face and he can tell they're solid even though it's dark. He's going to pull it together. It was just a dream, Scoob. You're fine. Wait, it's dark. Scoob flips to his belly to look out the window. Again, a bajillion and one stars. It was just creeping to dusk when he fell asleep, which means what time is it? He moves to climb down again and check, but something crunches beneath him. One of Jima's road maps. It all comes tumbling back then. Contraband and Jima acting weird and piles of money behind the TV. Jima's missing phone. Scoob swallows hard. He really wishes he had some water. And blinks back a wave of, well, he's not sure exactly. A few things hit him at once. He's trapped at some campground in Monroe, Louisiana, according to the map, without which he would have no idea where the heck he is, with no phone, no idea when he's going home. And he really, really misses dad, like more than he's ever missed anybody, especially after that horrible dream. Though, what can he do about it? Scoop doesn't have a clue. He sighs and lies back down, imagines the tire swing behind Jima's old house and playing with Shanice on it. Then he drifts back to sleep. Next time we get together, we will be reading Route 16, which is titled To Mexico. So we will find out if Mexico is where Jima and Scoob are headed. I'll see you then.